Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard the Pilot Money Guys podcast, where our mission is to help clients build and protect wealth to achieve their dreams and goals. This podcast is brought to you by Leading Edge Financial Planning. Without further ado, here is your host, Robert Eklund. A tip of the cap to you folks, and thank you for joining us for flight number 30, the challenge of chasing hot stocks. We're excited to be here. We're excited that you guys are listening. We have an augmented flight crew today. I'm subbing in for MC Rob Eklund, aka Rubber Mallet, as you all know. Um, sad, sad that he's not here still, but uh, we can't wait to get him back soon. He's probably living it up at the beach. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm joined as always by certified financial planner Charlie Mattingly, aka the Godfather. Welcome, here. Godfather. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good to have you again. And we're also joined, well, the, the best podcasts are joined by this man, C- yeah. certified financial planner, certified public accountant, Kevin Gormley, aka the professor. Kevin, excited to have you back. It's great professor. to be here, guys. I'm, I'm excited to be back. Yep. We're having, and Ben, you left off personal finance specialist. That's I, important. I, I I'm so sorry. I, I will uh, we'll fix this in post. We, we've got to add that in post. I'm sorry, Kevin. Ben, uh, ben, nobody, nobody even knows what that is. So don't, don't worry about it. I'm not even sure what that is, but I, I love it. I love it. Um, well, awesome, guys. And we're excited. We've got a great financial uh, topic today that we're going to get into. We have a lot to talk about, so much so that we had to cut some stuff out. We're, we're not even going to probably get to some of the things that we were originally going to talk about it. But we're excited. So let's just jump right in. But first... We've got to get to some airline news. Mm-hmm. Godfather, yes. what have we got today? It was a sad week in the uh, in the airline world. We had another 737 crash. China Eastern Airlines Flight 5735 went down. I can't remember the date now, Ben. Did you look that up, the date? I believe it was, uh, it was I, Monday, I believe, uh, and, that we got the, oh, uh, that's we got right. the notification. I remember waking up Monday and looking at that on my news as soon as I woke up. But... Um, mm-hmm. So flights 5735 went down without an emergency radio call from pilots slamming into a forested hillside about 100 miles from its destination. According to the Civil Aviation Administration of China, there were 132 souls on board and uh, nobody survived that one. Um, They basically went down, you know, nose first vertically, complete vertical dive uh, is, is how that went down. Yeah. Just off, Kevin, you were you were uh, saying uh, talking about it on Monday, um, but gosh, that's just just terrible. Hearts go out to everybody. Uh, I saw they were, had a search party about five thousand people um, trying to find, you know, any remnants really of the plane or anything they can figure out about what happened. Charlie, we were talking too before this that that they had found pieces of the plane about six miles away, which sounds like that indicates it may have already uh, torn up a little bit before before impacting the ground. Yeah, yeah. So what? So what we know now, or what the the news has reported, is uh, it was in a steep dive. In fact, when I started reading it Monday morning, uh, I kind of did the math because they said it went from thirty about thirty thousand feet to about ten thousand feet in like a two minutes. You can quickly do the math and go, that's about ten thousand feet a minute. And 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 there were other sections of that descent, maybe from ten thousand to to impact, where it was even more so, more like along the lines of fifteen thousand feet a minute so just to give everyone a perspective on airline descent rates your standard descent rate when you're just you know flying into chicago you have to have a minimum of a thousand feet a minute that's the usual descent rate a thousand feet a minute sometimes they might ask you to hurry it up down hey hurry down and give us two thousand feet a minute if you're really late to get down for whatever reason, sometimes they hold you high for traffic, then you might get to three to 4,000 feet a minute and passengers might start to notice maybe 4,000 feet a minute, if you, especially if you, if you went there abruptly. But 10,000 to 20,000 feet a minute is just insane in an airliner. It's not built for that. It doesn't have the structural you know, um, strength to withstand that. So that's probably what was happening. As it was going nose down that steep, it started to approach, probably started to approach supersonic speeds. That happened in, um, what was it, 97, Ben, that Indonesian 737, that was a suicide murder. They right. were almost supersonic straight down. So in this case, they think um, because of the structural integrity, parts of the airplane start coming off when you're going that fast. It's just not meant to fly that fast. 
So we don't know if that means it was, you know, came apart and then it went down or as it's going down, it's kind of coming apart. And I could probably believe the latter. Charlie, yeah. um, I know that we don't uh, conjecture about what happened, uh, yeah. you know, and, and I've not heard much conjecture, but I, I just ask you this for us non-pilots, uh, wh what are the things that, that probably didn't happen? I mean, you know, the pilots did not communicate. So that means it was just a sudden, it's a sudden issue. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, usually aircraft accidents happen around takeoff or landing. That's where the most common is because you're closest to the ground, you end up stalling, and you just don't have time to recover. Well, uh, this one, though, is uh, very different in that it was very, it was straight nose down. So Air France had a crash uh, years ago where they stalled in a storm because pilots lost awareness of their attitude, the airplane's attitude, whether it was down, straight up. They got very confused, but it stalled at that altitude, uh, probably a higher altitude, but it fell like a, it fell like a leaf straight down. And, and again, that's, this one fell nose down. And, and no pilot um, contact during this thing is kind of leads you to believe like, man, I, I just can't even imagine what else it would be except, you know, again, Indonesia Air had the same, a similar thing where it was a pilot murder slash suicide. And I haven't seen any of that conjecture in the news yet. Not that, not that I know of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I just, um, I don't know. There's not many things that could cause an airplane to physically point down like that. Yeah. And they, yeah. I, I saw they recovered the, uh, the vo flight voice recorder um, in the last couple day or two, or at least that's what has been reported. Uh, they're still looking for the flight data recorder, um, I believe is what we, we saw. Um, but hopefully we'll get new, more info. Hopefully they can find the flight data recorder and, and get more info out soon. I know kind of the world's watching this right now and mm -hmm. wonder what the heck's going on. They actually grounded the entire fleet of 737-800s in China. Um, they were actually one of the first ones to ground all the maxes actually back in the, when the, when the max uh, stuff was going on. Um, but they also have the largest supply of 737, 800. It, I think from my understanding, it's, it might be their most popular plane, com commercial plane that they have. So it's going to have a major impact on, on, uh, flights there in China. Obviously it's terrible news. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on though, to something maybe a little bit more fun. Stag Stagflation. Stagflation. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great economics. transition. <laughs> yeah. I had no real other way to do it except for the bandaid off. Um, that's right. I know everyone's been, you know, after that, they all want to hear about economics. First of all, what is stagflation? Investopedia <laughs> defines stagflation as an environment characterized by slow economic growth. So GDP and relative, relatively high unemployment which is at the same time accompanied by rising prices, i.e. inflation. So slow economic growth and high unemployment, which also is accompanied by rising prices. So just to set up that environment, the economy's not growing, people are losing their jobs, or at least the, there's not much job growth going on. At the same time, inflation is pricing you out of being able to buy anything. So that, that's the real worry there. But um, before I, I add any more uh, ec economics to that, what do you guys think? I don't Anything. know much about stagflation. It just is right. the last time this happened was the seventies. Right. I think it was the early seventies and uh, it was pretty ugly, but, um, but we haven't seen it since. I'm not sure that the consensus now is that we're headed that way. I, I think it's if, from what I've read is that we probably will not experience stagflation, but, uh, but it's interesting because it starts to be, you know, you start to start seeing some headlines and people start to chatter about it a little bit. But from what I've gathered yeah. and, and looked at, it looks like the chances are that we're not going to go in that direction, although in, anything is possible. Who knows what, what the future holds for us? Yeah, yeah, guys, right. in my lifetime, uh, they've used the word stagflation in the news, um, I, I'll say, thousands of times. And it's one of those words that it, uh, creates a visceral reaction and makes you want to click on it. Um, you know, back in the 70s, I think there was some stagflation, but but Ben, you, you might know better than me. I, I think there's been stagflation in some uh, developing countries over the years where you have uh, the currency falling, you know, by half. And then um, so so goods outside become much more expensive. And I, I think that's more common for stagflation, although 
Uh, I don't even have an, a minor in economics, so I'm not sure for sure about that. <laughs> As you said, it's been a headline topic. And I even saw in December of 2021, it was like one of the top searched Google words was stagflation. It was like a, one of the high, most highly searched Google term. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Everyone sees the headline, start searching. Did you search it, Kevin? Yeah, yeah, I searched, I searched it again because somebody asked me about it and I, I didn't know what it meant. Um, I kind of knew what it meant, but I wanted to see what the definition was. So, yeah. so Ben, I do have uh, I do have a comment here with a number of our clients calling and saying, uh, I'm worried about a recession. I'm worried about inflation. And the issue with a recession and inflation, usually when you have a recession, people stop spending as much. Therefore, prices mm -hmm. come down. Mm -hmm. So we, we've already kind of alluded to the fact that stagflation, it, you really have to have the perfect setup for it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I am personally afraid of inflation right now. I think we all are. Uh, there's right. a possibility there could be a recession. I mean, uh, mortgage rates have gone up. Uh, other rates have gone up a lot. There, you know, we don't see it yet. But uh, having both of those at the same time, um, uh, boy, I sure hope uh, that we don't have the um, the environment right now to have both of those at the same time. I just, I, I don't see it. We're having economic growth, which is a good thing. Um, the unemployment, uh, the un unemployment rate is down to about 3.8% as of February, 2022. Um, and so, you know, we're not seeing super high un unemployment rate. I, I will throw a contrarian comment in there in that, um, the labor force participation rate, which re measures how many people are actually actively searching for jobs is still quite a bit lower than it was pre pandemic levels, but the people searching for jobs seem to be able to get them. And so the unemployment rate is is pretty low. And in fact, it's, it's, it's very low. It's, it's encroaching almost no unemployment. So, so that's good. Um, but we also see the feds raising rates. I know a lot of the big banks are just reading Jamie Dimon is predicting 50 rate hikes in the next two years, which is, which is a ton, but there, there, there is serious concerns that some of these rate hikes may lead to some, some recessionary type environments. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think last time, Ben, we showed a, a graph from Ben Carlson, where he showed, I can't remember the start point, what 1930s or 40s, where every time inflation has exceeded 5%, we have gone into a recession. Mm -hmm. So again, that's not predictive. And, and so any, it's almost as if anything could happen. We could have inflation, or excuse me, yeah, it, we are having inflation. We could have stagflation, and we very well could go into a mild recession. Who knows? I got one more, one more comment. Um, so, so clients are constantly asking us, what should we invest in for inflation or, or, you know, maybe even stagflation now stagflation, mm -hmm. uh, there's really nothing to invest in. Uh, just pray that it ends quickly, I guess. But, <laughs> you know, like a lot of people are saying right now, well, you can't hold cash because if there's inflation, cash is worthless, worth less, not worthless, worth less. Mm -hmm. You can't hold bonds because bonds are good in deflationary environments. Uh, stocks, if, if there's inflation, you know, stocks, may, maybe they can't make as much money and stocks will go down. Uh, so there is no perfect asset. And I do think recently, from what I've seen, the discussions I've had with a number of clients is clients are coming up with ideas about what is the asset class we should invest in. And there, there's just no way to know what is going to be the next uh, asset class over the next 10 years to, to exceed all the others. And I think that's why um, it's best to kind of stay the course with, with what we believe through these times that are very, very stressful, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. One of the, a couple of our investing axioms, if you will, are we have to be prepared for the unknown because something crazy is going to happen in the future that we don't know about. We can't possibly anticipate uh, what world leaders like Putin are going to do. Again, that's, that's why you have a globally diversified portfolio because you just can't predict what might possibly happen, uh, whether it be an economic environment, a world calamity, or a geopolitical event, as they say. So yeah, absolutely. So instead of that, we just got to throw all our money in hot stocks, right? Oh, wait, we got to talk about that <laughs> yeah. first. We got to talk about yeah. that first. But, but, but before That's we right. jump into the financial topic, I've got to, I got to do an advertisement mm -hmm. for Rob. Um, all right, I'm going to try and do a better voice here. <clears throat> If you need, no, I can't do that. If you need help managing your investments or putting together a plan for retirement, give a fiduciary fee only advisor a call 
These folks uh, stand by ready to help. Uh, here at Leading Edge Financial Planning, we are fiduciary, which means we do what's in your best interest, not Wall Street's. We are fee-only advisors. Uh, we don't just do investments in retirement planning, but we also help with education savings, tax strategies, investment, insurance planning, estate planning, as well as others. Um, if, uh, if you're getting anxiety when you look at your finances, if you're worried about inflation, give us a call. Um, we're happy to help. 865-240-2292 or shoot us an email to info at leadingedgeplanning.com. All right. I, got a, little, I got a little, I, I got a little, uh, like I thought Rob was here. I mean, okay, was, good. Uh, I couldn't quite do his pretty, voice. Except but. the word jingle. He likes to say, give us a he jingle. Does. Give us yeah, a jingle. He does. All right. Next time. Next time. <laughs> You're doing great. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Ben, you've got your own style. It's, it's, it's excellent. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, we'll get Rob back probably next week. It just so happened that Rob goes on vacation. And we decide to knock out three or four podcasts. So, so uh, anyway, he'll be back <laughs> next time. So, so you're right, Ben, let's talk about that, that uh, suggestion that you had yeah. just buy the most recent highest flying, highest performing ETF, mutual fund stock, whatever it may be. Why don't we just do that? What do you, what do you think? I, I got to admit, um, before I knew anything really about investing, uh, when I started my first 401k, I, I looked through what did best the year before and just bought yeah. those funds. And I thought I was a genius. Yeah. Um, and it, it didn't work out very well at all. So <laughs> it seems like it's actually the opposite. You might be, you might do better if you do the opposite, you know, pick the yeah. poorest performing investment uh, fund, whatever. And you've probably got a, a just as good a chance or better as performing better the next year. Obviously we, we do take the long-term approach. We're not out to, to pick the highest flying thing. You know, there's one uh, saying that people say, don't invest through the rear view mirror. And that is strictly picking your investments based off of past performance. Um, we always have to say on every one of these podcasts that future performance uh, or past performance is not indicative of future performance. And it's true. It's absolutely true. And in fact, I think sometimes we get tricked into buying uh, the most popular, most recent fund ETF uh, stock. My example that I want to talk about today that I think is just fascinating is I think in, in about July of 2020, I said these words. It seems, Kevin, Ben, it seems like a no-brainer just to put everything we have in ARC. Why don't we just do that? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like everybody sees the returns. The previous year was amazing. The current year is amazing. Why don't, you know, why do you not do that? It's just like you feel kind of stupid for not doing that. But but it's fascinating now to look back and we only learn these lessons in retrospect. So I'm totally cherry, pick, cherry picking data just to do a thought experiment. But, but I don't know, Kevin, what does it feel like to you sometimes? I mean, there's all these great investing tactics. But hey, what's up? Just real quick, I got to say, and for those who may not know, ARK, ARKK is the symbol. It's ARK Innovation ETF. Yes. I just wanted to throw that out there. Nice. It's the hot talked about uh, ETF. Uh, Kathy Woods, is that her name? Uh, the, I think the so, yeah. The manager, but yep. uh, exploded in 2020. But uh, sorry, just yep. wanted to give that background. No, that's all right. That's good stuff. Go ahead, but, and it's not yeah. just the only one, but Kevin, go ahead. It's the right, right. others. Yeah, so uh, I don't think we're dunking on Kathy Woods here or uh, saying that she's an idiot or people are idiots for investing in it. Um, kind of the way I came about learning about ARC was a number of clients called me and said, uh, you know, don't you want to invest in companies that are disrupting uh, you know, technology and disrupting the world. And I said, yeah, I, I kind of do. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. and then Mark, even Mark on our team contacted me and said, Hey, Kevin, I, I, I'm really thinking about buying ARC. And I said, how come? And he said, two reasons it's disrupting technology and also it's going up. So yeah. when you, when you hear that something is going up, uh, boy, it sounds like it's on its way and you better get on board and so, unfortunately, when I learned about ARC, uh, it had already done great. And, um, I, you know, I didn't do so great afterwards. Yeah, yeah. And you know that once, once you hear about an investment that is doing great, my first thought, Kevin, is like, that's ah, too late. It's too late for us. Because once you know that, it is too late. You know, you are late to the party. And if you didn't get into that when it was probably a difficult decision like, oh, this is, looks terrible. Let's get into it. You know, that's, that's why investing is weird. It plays tricks on our minds. And I think now is a good time to talk about one of my favorite behavioral biases that we all suffer from. 
is the recency bias. So, yeah. so yeah, Kevin, Charlie, go ahead. before you, before you go down that path, yeah. I, I'd like to just say that there is a known uh, part of markets that's momentum that that is known. And so the hard part about momentum is when it changes. So yes, when something is going up, sometimes it continues for multiple years and FAMA and French have, have stated that this is something that just, it doesn't make sense, but it, yeah. it is something that's in markets. So, so anyway, yeah. uh, I just wanted to make that comment that the problem with momentum though, is when it reverses, but, but go ahead, yeah. Charlie, let's talk about recency bias. Yeah. Recency bias is just as it's human nature for all of us to take the most recent bits of information and overweight them, give them too much credit or importance. And let me, ex let me explain why we're wired that way. Pretend you're going through an intersection and you see someone run a red light <clears throat> and you're about to be blindsided. You're about to be hit. Well, it actually is to our advantage to take that information and give it the utmost importance to save your butt. So now the alternative to that, it'd be going through this intersection and go, well, typically statistics say that uh, I'm going to survive this and, and uh, I'll just, you know, you do this analyzation. Well, that's not how our, we're wired for survival reasons. Unfortunately, that does not work in the stock market. We cannot take the most recent one year, two year, whatever time period, and then give it too much credit. So, but it is so tempting to see those returns and go, I got to get that. And there's that fear of missing out, right? Uh, and, and in fact, we're picking on ARC today. The end of the story is not over. This, you know, it could be a great investment. It might go on to do great things. We don't know. I just think it's an amazing thought experiment. So hang on with me just for a second. And you all jump in as necessary. So ARC started in November of 2014, I believe it was. It started pretty uneventfully. The first 12 months performance, November to November 2015, was about two, just under 2%. And the S&P in the same time period was just under 4%. So, you know, big deal. Why would anybody hop into this fund right now? There's no reason to. We don't know anything about it. Nobody's on, you know, nobody's too excited about it. 2015, similar returns as the S&P, about just under 4% for ARC and, and a little over 1% for S&P 500. And I won't belabor this too much. The, the returns don't get exciting until 2017 when ARC returned about 87% to the S&P's 21%. Now, here's something interesting too. What do we compare ARC to? You know, Morningstar first compared it to a tech fund. Then they compared it to mid cap. Then they compared it to something else. So I'm using the S&P and, and probably not even apples to apples, but it just gives us a reference point. <laughs> so once the, the interesting thing is at the end of 2017, excuse me, end of 2016, ARC was rated in the bottom 98% quartile, according to Morningstar. At the end of 2017, after it returned 87%, it's the top 1% quartile. So, you know, it's interesting that that is a great year. The following year was uh, pretty mediocre. 2018 was, was not great at 3.5%, uh, although it did outpace the S&P at uh, a little under 4%, or excuse me, uh, minus 4% for the year is about what the S&P was. Again, 2019 was uh, very close to the S&P, still bottom 57 quartile for ARC. In year 2020 is when things really took off, 157% annualized return for 2020 to the S&P's 18%. So that's when the mania started, Kevin, right? That's uh, what the young people say, to the moon. To the, to moon, the moon, yeah. Yep. Right, to the moon. That's what I was telling people, to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when should we have bought or when should we have purchased ARC? You know, we probably should have purchased it when it was doing poorly. When it was in the bottom 98% quartile, according to Morningstar, is when you should have purchased ARC. Unfortunately, we just don't do that. You know, uh, I think, uh, what did I say? How many ETFs and mutual funds are there in the United States? I keep forgetting this number. There's like, I think it's 9,000. There are 9,000. Let me get the exact number. 9,027 mutual funds, 2,300 ETFs in the U.S. alone. So... Again, Kevin, I'm just amazed, like what's going to trigger my mind as an investor to buy an ETF that's in the bottom 98% quartile, according to Morningstar? Well, maybe it's Kathy Wood's prior uh, investment returns, yeah. which Absolutely. were not very good. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't study they Kathy were, Wood's they that were, much. They were, they, were, they were pretty average. Yeah. 
So, you know, there's a lot of numbers I'm throwing out here, but 2020 is the year. Okay. So, but so let me show you now, or, or just at least talk to when did all the money flow into ARC? When did people start investing in ARC? And Morningstar shows us the inflows of money started in the summer of 2020, right? Summer, December, January 2021 is when the vast majority of people invested in ARC. And that's because of the recency bias. We just talked about it. Why, why else would you have invested in ARC? It, it, you know, it had one good year there in 2017, but, but now we're, we're getting serious and we do not want to miss out on that. So what kind of returns do we get now when we jump in after the fact that these returns have just killed it? So I ran some numbers. I, I've got the uh, prices, a simulated investment of $10,000. So if I purchased, let's say I was ahead of the curve a little bit in July 2020, I jumped in. I jumped in with my $10,000. That was just before the buying spree, the spending spree started on ARC. So July 2020, I invest $10,000 in ARC. As of March 1st, 2022, I end up with $7,000. That's currently right now. Well, everybody else actually started investing in December, January of December 2020 and January 2021. $10,000 invested then would be worth about $4,871 right now. So again, I'm, I know I've talked a lot, but I'm just so fascinated at this story of this high flying stock or ETF, which is could be a quality ETF. We're not bagging it. We're just talking about Kevin. I'm talking about the difference between what we see as a headline, what we see as these annualized returns versus what the investor actually experiences. And it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, Charlie, the other thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, I, I do read some of the investor chats, and I, I kind of enjoy that. It's like a guilty pleasure. And, and a lot of the people that invest in ARC, they say, hey, it's due for to come back, and they're using the terminology reversion to the mean. And so, you know, we, we as a company strongly believe the investment data that shows that, you know, being patient in investments does pay off in the long run. But what we're talking about here is an actively managed fund that has very few companies and sometimes dumps companies when they do poorly. So this reversion to the mean idea, um, the companies that were owned a year ago or two years ago may not be the companies that are in it next year. And yeah. those companies may revert to the mean. So that's the first uh, comment I have. The second comment I have is if I told you I'm going to start an exchange traded fund and I'm only going to invest in non-profitable companies that have a lot of exciting future, also known as small cap growth, mm -hmm. would you want to invest in uh, non-profitable companies? Now, now Tesla did during the last few years did get a profit and uh, kudos to uh, uh, Musk and the team there. So uh, you know they did get a profit, but most of these companies just weren't profitable. And, uh, you know, non-profitable companies don't have a great track record, uh, you know, in investing. Especially the small ones, like you said. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, and again, we're, we're I know we're beating up on ARC, but, but let's just give them a better chance because there's, this could apply to anything, you know, uh, it could apply to a single stock, it could apply to a crypto, Ben's favorite, you know, Dogecoin or whatever you want to, now we, we prefer let me clarify, we prefer fundamentally sound, profitable companies, but nonetheless, the lessons we learned here, like if you're, how could you be successful in ARC? Let's just play the other side of the coin. You need to, you should have purchased ARC when it was in the bottom 98% percentile, according to Morningstar, or at the very beginning, and not sold it. If Had you done that, invested $10,000 in the fall of 2014, you actually still would be profitable. You'd have about $35,000. But the tough part is nobody is really does that. It's just really hard. And again, what reason would you have to invest in that particular ETF at that time? There's no sign. There's no signal. There's no evidence that says invest here. Charlie, yeah. as a matter of fact, mutual funds that are in the bottom uh, of uh, mutual fund ratings, Morningstar has showed that they are actually not, <laughs> they're worse investments typically than ones that do moderate or, or do well. So the, the investing, I know you're saying it tongue in cheek, invest it when it was mm -hmm. doing terrible, but that, that's not a signal either. Don't, don't yeah. look for the worst performing mutual <laughs> funds and say, hey, let's, yeah. uh, let's start systematically investing in all the worst performing mutual funds. It's, yeah. That's not been a winner either.
Absolutely. And, and, and I'm sorry, Ben, but the, the yeah, Morningstar, ahead. their ratings come after the fact. Everything is, you know, rear looking. Now they do have a system that tries to look ahead, but nonetheless, um, every rating, every the star ratings at Morningstar, and again, they're, they're a good company, they have great information, but those are rearward looking. So go ahead, Ben. No, I, that's actually exactly what I was going to say. I think Morningstar's ratings are something that's extremely popular with uh, with investors, with retail investors. And looking at those ratings, I, I personally have bought uh, funds again back when I was making decisions uh, based on past performance, just based on their Morningstar rating as well. And um, as you can see, they don't really signal uh, much, really. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, just to summarize this little segment here before we hand it off to, to the professor here is just, by the time you hear about this amazing performance, just be careful buying into that because what we believe is the price that you pay for these things is really important. You could invest if for somehow you knew some company was going to be the greatest company in the world. That's great. But if you buy that at the wrong price, in other words, after, let's say it's been bid up because of popularity, you could possibly never profit from that investment. So in other words, you could have a great investment, you could buy the investment, but if you bought the wrong price, like some people, like most people purchased ARC, as of March 1st, they are not profitable, most of the people that purchased ARC within the last seven, five, six, seven years. I'll, uh, I'll just, before I, I tee you up, Kevin, I'll just say that uh, we have uh, another article and blog post on a, most of the topics that, or most of the points that we've talked about even today um, on our website, it's called The Envious Investor. So if you want to know more and want to dive into it a little bit more, go to that uh, blog post on our website or go to our YouTube channel, watch Charlie's video, The Envious Investor. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Ben, for the plug. But Kevin, mm -hmm. to set you up, we were talking to some people this week and we were having this old discussion about <clears throat> why don't you guys and girls uh, on the team there believe or why don't you buy the you know, individual stocks. Why don't you just go out and find the best individual stock and buy that for us? It seems like that's what we, that's what you should do. So you had a great response and, and I'll, I'll paraphrase or maybe try to get it right. But you said, Hey, over the long term, 57% of these individual equities are outperformed by T-bills. Is that right, Kevin? Yeah, that that's exactly right, Charlie. Um, actually I misquoted it's 58%. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know where I got 57, but it was 58%. Well, yeah. and, and this is from uh, Bessenbinder, Bessenbinder et al. Uh, they went back to 1926 and looked at the U.S. to 2017. They also uh, went back and developed markets, and they saw, or foreign markets, I should say, and they saw exactly uh, the, the same uh, trend. Where, where most of the stocks, um, even in foreign markets, uh, U.S. Treasury bills did better than the majority of stocks. So that, that has been seen now consistently in the U.S. as well as foreign markets. Yeah, that, that's incredible. So this guy goes back to 1926 to 2017. And, and correct me if, if I'm wrong here, he analyzes every single stock in that period. Is that what he did? Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, belief that the early days, 1926, et cetera, th there weren't computers. So they are pulling data, uh, you know, from 1926, and they're looking at every stock they can see. Um, there's, this has been replicated, uh, agony and ecstasy, man, maybe we can put that in the uh, show notes, Ben, mm -hmm. from JP yep. Morgan, they, they did it from 1970. Um, and I think it was to 2018. But they, they did a similar search, but Bessenbinder, you know, he uh, was at a, um, a, a, a educational institution. So those professors, they love to torture mm -hmm. the data. And so his team uh, went back and tortured the data. And his question was, do they outperform T-bills, which is a brilliant question, because what are T-bills considered to be, Charlie? Ben, what are they considered to be, T-bills? One of the safest, if not the safest investment that you could possibly be in. Cash. Yeah, they're, 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 called like cash. Risk, they're called yeah. risk free, risk free yeah. investments. So, yeah. and, uh, you know, he was very surprised, uh, his, his group, I don't want to say it was all him. I'm sure there were other people that did the work. He got to put his name on there, but still, um, they were surprised that it was 58% of the stocks did not do as well as T bills over that time period. 
Yeah, that's just fascinating. And, um, you know, just more on that discussion was like individual stocks, man, that sounds so cool to go to go and select them and, you know, pick the ones that you like for whatever reasons. And you can even do all the research. You can do the homework. You can study the financials. You can study the all the applicable ratios that that apply to that industry. But that doesn't guarantee or it doesn't mean going forward that uh, there's going to be some kind of business risk. You know, in the airlines, we always say we're one CEO away from a completely different company. You're one crash away from a really different company. And that's never reflected in any kind of financial statement anywhere. So that's business risk. And we, we like to diversify business risk away. Um, I'll just add, like, it, it reminds me of going to the casino, really. I mean, with, with the, the table stacked against you, if 58% of stocks failed to beat treasury bills over, over the lifetime, I mean, it's, it's like you're going to the table and you already have, are at a disadvantage and you know the house has a chance of, has a better odds of winning, so. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Ben, is that the odds are stacked against you. Um, sorry oh. about that. Uh, <laughs> the, that's that's uh, Sean, my, my bourbon buddy. Uh -oh. uh, so as I was saying, the odds are stacked, not only stacked against you. Um, now, now T-bills are risk-free, but T-bills did have a positive return. So we're not saying that 58% of the stocks had a negative return. I think that's something that people sometimes hear. Right, good point. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the, the second part of it was, um, and, and I think the number is 28%, Ben, 28% uh, uh, of the stocks. It's like 38%, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah beat the treasury sorry. bills by just moderate amounts. Yeah, so 38% of the companies um, actually beat treasury bills by a moderate amount. But uh, fascinating part, and again, this was kind of a shock to me, is that only 4% of the companies a massively outperformed treasury bills over that long time period. Uh, you know, were you guys surprised at that number of 4%? <clears throat> yeah, I can't believe it. I mean, it just says 4% of stocks are responsible for boosting the market's overall returns higher than those on treasury bills. That's from 1926 to 2017. And, and you know, just to clear the air a little bit, we, we love stocks, we love companies, but we just love lots of them all over the world. We love thousands of them, different kind of markets. And it's really, uh, if you're going to go out and just kind of do the analysis and pick, it, it becomes a logistical, not to mention tax nightmare, uh, transaction fees, etc. So that, you know, the, the going out and doing that kind of investing, especially if you're buying a few of them, uh, like we said the other day, Kevin, the the risk return profile is just really, really poor. And it and the data shows that over and over and over again, Yet the allure of the arcs in the individual stocks is just so powerful. You know, it's just pretty amazing. Yeah. And Charlie, you know, the recency bias, uh, you know, over the last couple of years and uh, we've been getting beat up. Uh, all, all financial planners have been getting beat up because there's people picking stocks and uh, they're telling each other about how great they're doing in 2019, 2020. Now, 2021, I'm not hearing very much anymore with these stock pickers, but it, it really was a tough time, I think, to be a financial planner who believed in diversification because a lot of people were doing extremely well picking all the same companies. And then, unfortunately, when the punch bowl went away, uh, these companies that were the, the, the mega winners, uh, uh, you know, they went away. So, um, but I will say that the mega winners, JP Morgan calls these 4% of the companies, and they did their study from 1980 to 2020. Those are the exact dates, 1980 to 2020. They found 10% of companies were the mega winners during this time period. So it was a little bit higher. They also found that 66% um, of the companies from 1980 to 2020 had negative returns versus the Russell 3000. So again, 66% of the companies did worse than the index. Wow. What do you think about that? Yeah, you, you better hope that the ones that you pick are in the 44% the and driving those returns. And if not, you're going to miss out on them. You're going to miss out on the on the gains. And that's what we, we talk about with uh, owning the winners. You got to own them because those are what are really, there's only a small percentage that are really driving everything. And this statistic just reinforces it. So has anyone been able to just pick the winners? I mean, that, that is the, 
the comment that we've heard from a number of people is why don't you just buy the good stocks? Yeah, I, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. By, by the way, everyone but Ben probably on this call has uh, tried to just pick the winners. Uh, I went through my evolution. Um, you know, that that's the one part about getting older that's great is that you you can learn when it comes to investing uh, how how little you know about which are going to be the winners. And then when you see something like Bessenbinder that tells you, hey, fifty eight percent then you kind of know that the odds are against you. I mean, even Kramer did better than 58%. Uh, you know, Kr Kramer on TV, a lot of financial people make fun of him, but the odds are against you when you're picking stocks. Mm -hmm. It's not Kramer's fault. Bessenbinder says it's just, it's just the odds. Yeah, and then determining, you know, how much stock you should, or how much money you should put into each stock, how much stock should you own of each of those companies that you pick also really will vary your returns as well. And you know, and, and to do that with your retirement money, that's a little scary to me. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, it's, you know, just to wrap it up here, I know we're getting close on time, but I know you referenced that envious investor. And I think that's the one where we, we got a graph. Um, I can't remember the source. It was BlackRock. That's what it was. But it showed yeah. how painful diversification is. You never feel like you're winning when you're diversified. In fact, somebody said uh, you feel like you want to throw up because you if you own the right things, when times are good, there's going to be something in there you just hate. That's how you know you're properly diversified. It never feels great until the, until you start to widen that lens and you take many years and you go, oh, well, look at that. It did pay off and it does work, but it takes a while. And each year by year, you kind of feel lame sometimes <laughs> when you're really diversified. It, it's kind of hard. Yeah. Charlie, so, uh, and, and I'll ask Ben the question. I like to pick on Ben. Yeah. <laughs> ben, if you were going to pick a sector from 1980 to 2020, you know, all the different sectors, uh, community service uh, or communication services, consumer discretionary, et cetera, et cetera, wh where would you, where would you have invested your money? Uh, in which, in which sector would you have invested your money? I mean, I got, I mean, I got to go with tech, IT, technology. I'm going, I'm going with energy. Recency bias. Yeah. I'm going with energy. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. So, so, so Charlie, uh, 84% of the energy companies underperformed the Russell oh. over that time period. So Bad uh, call. you're out. Bad call. Uh, ben, I'm still uh, in this. 70, 73% of the tech companies underperformed the, uh, the Russell 3000. Russell 3000 is a lot like the, you know, the S and P 500. It's, it's just a really broad based uh, index. So the actual best sector to pick companies in was consumer staples. Only 61% of those companies underperformed. Wow. So, so, so here's, here's the bottom line. This is what I now believe is that it's hard to pick the winners. You know, the, the winners are this, and then all of a sudden coronavirus comes. Then all of a sudden Ukraine happens. Then all of a sudden this happens. And you know, there's so many things that are coming at us as investors. Uh, if we can just stay invested in markets, I think I think we're doing mm -hmm. great, especially mm -hmm. because it seems like we get the the heck scared out of us very often. Yeah, it is scary to be so, an investor. Yeah, absolutely. So the the final thing I'll I'll say, uh, Bessenbinder said that he he originally wanted to call his article positive skew, and then he was quickly talked out of it because nobody would read it. <laughs> so, but the key, the key message around all of this data is that you, as Ben said already, you always want to own the winners. The only way to always own the winners is to, is to own pretty much all. That's the, that's the only way. And what ends up happening, this positive skewness is that the winners, a winner can win and go up 16 million percent. A loser, what, what can a loser go down? What's the most that a loser can go down? 100%. 100% to zero. So these winners that are mega, mega winners always are dragging the indexes forward. And that's the, really the reason why, um, you know, Jack Bogle said it's so hard to beat an index. And it's not just the S&P 500, there's multiple indexes. So, so we strongly believe in not stock picking, although again, it's, it's so hard. And as Charlie said uh, earlier this week, we all cheat a little when it comes to owning <laughs> stocks because we still, we still think we're smarter than we are. Yeah, absolutely. Right.
Well, any, any last, uh, last words guys? No, it was fun. It was good to have the professor back on and, uh, fun, fun topic too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, awesome. We have, uh, we have officially arrived then at our final destination. Thank you all for tuning in for flight 30. Uh, we really appreciate you listening and giving us some support. If you have, uh, if you liked what you heard, give us a, give us a comment, give us a like, subscribe, share it with your friends. We really would appreciate it. If you want to reach out to us again, just call us at uh, 865-240-2292 or shoot us an email at info leading edge planning.com. Thank you, Godfather. Thank you, Professor. We're out of here. Thank you for listening to the Pilot Money Guys podcast. It has been our pleasure to share some information with you today. Give us a call to discuss absolutely any investment question you may have. Click on the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit leadingedgeplanning.com to learn more. Take care. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Leading Edge Financial Planning, LLC. Leading Edge Financial Planning, LLC, Leading Edge, is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Leading Edge and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. These documents may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-thinking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.